uh, SACOG Policy and Innovation Committee meeting for Monday, uh, April the 5th. Um, can, uh, will everyone uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and do roll call, please. Okay, just before roll call, uh, we're going to do a few housekeeping items. Uh, as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be available to view on SACOG's website after the meeting. For any members of the public tuning in today and who wish to make a comment, you can notify us by selecting raise your hand or by pressing the star nine on your phone if participating telephonically. All public comment will be limited to three minutes each. And to help with timing, I will give the speaker a one minute warning. But lastly, for our committee members, please remember to mute yourselves until you are ready to speak as this will help us eliminate any background noise. And when you are ready to speak, please use the raise your hand feature or press star nine if phoning in to alert the chair. All right, members, please prepare to indicate whether you are present when I call your name. Uh, Director Bernsconi. Absent. Uh, Director Burris. Present. Director Ferricks. Absent. Director Gog. Yes. Director Lozano. Absent. Director Middleton. Present. Director Stollard. Present. Director Thomas. Present. Vice Chair Kozlowski. Present. And Chair Saragossa. Here. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And I know we have a full, full agenda today. So Eric, when we were going over this, I. And I, then I looked at it again. I was like, wow, we have a, a lot to get through in a couple of hours. So um, hopefully we'll, right. uh, we'll move along here uh, uh, at a steady pace. Uh, so if everybody will, will bear with me as we move through the agenda. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and move to the uh, consent items. Uh, did we have any public comment on the consent items? Move you approval of the consent comment. calendar, Mr. Chair. Thank I you. I second that. Thank you, Mr. Stollard, Mr. Gog. Uh, any questions on the consent calendar? All right, seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Sorry, give me one moment to mute myself there. No problem. Um, please indicate your uh, vote. Director Bernasconi. Absent. Yes. Oh. oh, here I am. My apologies. Mm -hmm. The record showed Bernasconi voted yes. Uh, Director Burris? Yes. Director Ferricks? Absent. Director Gog? Yes. Lozano? Uh, absent. Director Middleton? Yes. Stollard? Uh, yes. Thomas? Yes. Vice Chair Kozlowski? Yes. And Chair Saragossa? Yes. Motion carries. All right. And and I'm sorry, I've been having trouble unmuting. Uh, I vote yes as well. Lozano. Let the record show Lozano voted yes and is present. Sorry about that. I just uh, lost my screen there for a second. Okay, so we are going to uh, adjourn as the uh, Policy and Innovation Committee and uh, re-adjourn uh, as the SACOG Financing Corporation Board of Directors. And I believe uh, we'll have to do another uh, roll call here if I'm, I'm not mistaken. Uh, so we'll, we'll have this down here. <laughs> we'll have a lot of these before we do anything else. So uh, go ahead, Robert. <laughs> All right, directors, please prepare to indicate whether you are present when I call your name. Uh, Director Bernasconi. Present. Present. Director Burris. Present. Director Frerichs. Absent. Director Gog. 
Yes. Present. <laughs> Director Lozano. Um, Lozano is present, indicating audio issues. Uh, Director Middleton. Present. Uh, Stollard. Present. Thomas. Present. Vice Chair Kozlowski. Uh, Vice Chair Kozlowski, please indicate your, if you're present. Let's say absent, maybe experiencing some audio issues. And Chair Sargosa. Here. All right. You do have a quorum. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on uh, to our action items. Uh, mm -hmm. and the first one is uh, appointing officers uh, of the SACOG Financing Corporation. And Mr. Johnson has this report for us this morning. Sure, and maybe um, in the interest of time, I will just kind of talk about these three items yes. um, together, and then we can go through um, and then do the separate votes on these. So um, the SACOG Financing Corporation, as is explained in the, in the various three items, was set up when SACOG was involved in the purchase of its offices at 1415 L Street in the early 2000s. Um, we most recently used the Financing Corporation to uh, renovate the SACOG offices back in 2019. Um, they're still in great condition. Uh, last year, we haven't really done anything with them. So. Um, at this point, um, the financing corporation is really only set up because SACOG as a joint powers authority is not able to own real estate um, and we're not intending to use this for any other real estate um, reasons. So the, the actions here are simply to unwind the financing corporation, move the dollars back to SACOG. This committee, when the um, financing corporation was set up, actually serves as the board of directors. So the SACOG board of directors is not govern the SACOG Financing Corporation, you are the board of directors. So the first action we need to take is appoint officers to the SACOG Financing Corporation to reflect the officers that are currently officers of this committee, um, and then take an action to transfer the assets from the Financing Corporation back to SACOG so that you and your colleagues on the SACOG board can then take actions on what to do with the assets of the Financing Corporation. And then the final action would be to authorize us to take the necessary steps to dissolve the finance and corporation with the state of California. Um, are there any questions? One question. Uh, yeah. Finance and corporations are a, a pretty useful legal vehicle uh, for doing some things from time to time. And I think it actually predated the 2000 purchase of, of involved in our current building. It actually involved S Street, the, the former location, because I was actually part of it then. Are you sure you want to get rid of this vehicle? I mean, I realize it's, it's, it's husbanding over what, what, three or $4 million. I don't remember the exact amount, <clears throat> but this corporation can transfer those, those assets periodically. And I think we have over time, haven't we? Shifted some of the money from the financing corporation to the SACOG uh, organization. So in other words, I know you've got legal sure. formalities you have to keep track of and financial realities, sure. but are you sure you want to get rid of this legal vehicle? If you yeah, say yes, I'm going to vote yes. <laughs> if you say no. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an excellent um, question, Mr. Soller, and I appreciate um, uh, the, the clarification to the history. Um, the the um, most recent change to when the financing, when um, SACOG's prior offices at uh, 3000 S Street were sold. Um, SACOG then transferred $2 million into what essentially was kind of a shell corporation that was just sitting there. I helped um, with and that. And it sat the there. <laughs> yeah. And, and so those funds sat there and, and interest accrued um, since the, uh, the early 2000s. And when um, SACOG sold its interest in the building at 1415 L Street, um, we, you know, nearly doubled that. And again, that was part of when Mr. Stallard was on the board uh, in his first tour. Um, those assets have sat there uh, for this time. And one of the things that um, we have looked at and, and has, uh, um, uh, has changed in the last few years is some opportunities with CalPERS to um, get a better return on the money that effectively is just sitting there. So I think perhaps um, separating the two issues of 
the funds in the corporation, and then what are the legal vehicles that SACOG needs to do innovative new things? And to the latter point about kind of what's the vehicle that we could have to use for some flexibility, it is a good question and one that um, Mr. Corliss has asked legal counsel and me to look at. And I think um, we are interested in potentially looking at a nonprofit or other entities to help us do innovative things. But this one, because the articles of incorporation are so narrowly written, um, it really is just focused on real estate transactions. I think once we have a better idea of the types of things we want to do, we have talked to counsel about ways to set up a nonprofit that would be more flexible and will allow us to get into different um, things that, that SACOG can't do as a joint powers authority. So I think it's a good question and definitely something that is relatively easy for us to stand something up when we kind of define the purpose for that. Um, and we, we would like to do that, but I think we've, we've scratched the surface and this specific entity isn't the one that we want to, to keep in business. I accept, I accept what you have to say. I do know that one of the, the California State Association of Counties has a financing corporation. Also, I'm a former director there. And uh, it was a very useful vehicle for us to do things that were, it had more flexibility than the actual organization did. So we used it to support retreat expenses and things like that. And it actually made money because other entities would use our financing corporation as a vehicle to do things they wanted to do throughout the state. So if you if this is your conviction, then I then I accept it and I thank you for the patience in sharing your view. Sure. Any other questions uh, from directors, comments? James, I don't know if you wanted to uh, speak to this at all. Yeah, uh, Director Stollard, I, I appreciate that question because, as Eric said, I asked exactly the same one. You know, um, boy, would we have to, are we dissolving this just to create something that looks a lot like it? But I, I'm satisfied that, as 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 Mr. Johnson said, that the uh, the articles of incorporation are narrowly written. This is the right thing to do now, um, and that there is, I think, as as Eric mentioned, there are some opportunities to create. Um, some sort of a nonprofit structure uh, that would allow us again to uh, to be more nimble, to be creative, to do some of the um, the things I think the board's interested in doing. I, I and and you're really the veteran at this point, <laughs> Director Stollard, on this. And I and I appreciate your comments about um, you know this was and again for the rest of the board uh, way before my time. But you know the board made two I think very smart investments in real estate. And, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the discussion around staying in our office that happened a couple of years ago and where we were looking to move and our lease was about to expire, uh, drew down some of those assets. I know some of you had questions about drawing down those assets. I, we think it was a very smart thing to do to renovate yeah. the office, stay in place, uh, get a very good uh, rent. Uh, of course, we, that was pre-pandemic. <laughs> you know, if I had known, we would have stayed a couple of years longer. And, um, but, uh, but, but those were very smart decisions. And so I think, again, the, this agency uh, and this board uh, is reaping the benefits of very, two very smart real estate decisions. But I do think this is the right thing to do right now. And uh, other items will talk about exactly what we uh, intend to do with the, with the balance of those funds. Uh, but again, Director Stollard in particular, you know, thank you for your foresight and your leadership over the last couple of decades so that we're in this position. Um, much appreciated. Well, you know, there's not too many places where we can be, shall we say, capitalistic. And this financing corporation allowed us to take, turn two million into well over three million. I don't know what it was finally, but it was great. And, and CSAC's financing corporation does the same thing. Other people hitchhiked on it. I don't even know it could be a shared service opportunity, but it allowed us to do things that were outside the scope of our normal organizational framework. So, and you can amend articles. You don't have to collapse and collapse a financing corporation to create something new. You can amend the articles and, and change the scope. The directors can do that. So, and I, I know you've got legal counsel, so I don't want to rethink what other people have been analyzing, but uh, clearly this was a very useful vehicle for an extended period of time. And I, I don't believe in letting money sit forever doing nothing. I mean, I agree, but you know, we've always had the option of of disgorging those funds or 
adopting certain purposes for those funds independent of the SACOG organization uh, and would, would have more flexibility than SACOG itself has. So anyway, forgive me if the lawyer in me is coming out. <laughs> no, thank you, Tom. I think those are, you know, all items that we need to reflect on uh, so that we're not just recreating a wheel here if we had something already. Uh, but again, you know, I'll, I'll defer to, to legal counsel on this as well and also look forward to what the next iteration of this may be um, because I do think, you know, Tom and uh, is correct. We To have that vehicle and to have that flexibility is something we should still have as an option, you know, as we move forward. Uh, so I don't know if that's something that's going to be on the immediate horizon. I know you, Eric, touched on it a little bit, but um, you know, what that, you know, a nonprofit or another financing corporation of some sort, uh, so that we do have that mechanism still available to the, to say, Cog. Certainly. I, I think just, just to speak to it briefly, it's something that, you know, we have, as we've explored different shared services over the last few years, looked at what are our peers really across the country doing in this space, whether it's, um, nonprofits that are affiliated with councils that can receive grants from foundations. Um, those that have revenue opportunities or charge fee for service for things. So I think we're trying to um, really better analyze what those things are and how we might make them fit in a SACOG context and which of those um, can work in California and which cannot. I think, unfortunately, we've uh, pursued some things that we could have used a nonprofit affiliate for that, sadly, because of um, California law and um, CalPERS uh, are not allowable, um, but we're still looking for things that we could we could use a, a nonprofit for and be a leader in that space. Thank you, James. Were you going to? Well, and um, exactly. Just, so just to just to close on this, we we absolutely have our eyes on this. <clears throat> I have even when I started at SACAR, uh asked actually about the a nonprofit structure. Uh, which I think is uh, is easily created. Uh, so stay tuned. It would come back to this committee, and I know we intend to do that this year, and give you uh, once we've done a bit more analysis in terms of the shared services and some of the other, the other flexibility and nimbleness that we want to have as we go forward. Um, so again, I, I, I'm satisfied. I've, I've asked these questions. I'm satisfied with this is the right direction to go, but I'm also not satisfied that our current JPA will actually allow us to do the work that we need to do going forward. And again, this is, you're, you're, the, you're the committee, uh, the over, really the overseeing committee on this. Um, so, so stay tuned. Okay, thank you, James. Thank you, Eric. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Robert, do we have any public comments on uh, items one through three? Uh, no public comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll do these, uh, so we'll uh, go back to item one, uh, the appointment of officers of the SACOG Financing Corporation. Uh, I'll entertain a, a motion. Move approval. Thank you. Mr. Second. All right, uh, Stollard and moved by Gog. Um, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, roll call please. All right, directors, uh, indicate your vote. Uh, Bernsconi? Yes. Burris? Yes. Frerichs, absent. Uh, Gog? Yes. Lozano? Yes. Uh, Middleton? Yes. Stollard? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Kozlowski? Vice Chair Kozlowski is on the call, but I believe he's experiencing some issues. And Chair Saragosa? Aye. All right, motion carries. Okay, thank you. Uh, so then we will go to action item two, uh, which is the transfer of the assets of the, of the SACOG Financing Corporation Fund. Someone make a what? motion. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'll do it. Thank you, Mr. Stollard. Second. For a second. I think I got uh, Director Middleton for on the second there. Um, okay. Uh, any other further comments? Seeing um, none, uh, we will go to uh, roll call, please. All right. Please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Bernsconi? Yes. Uh, Burris? Yes. Frerichs? Absent. 
Gog? Yes. Luzano? Aye. Middleton? Yes. Stollard? Yes. Thomas? Yes. And Vice Chair Kozlowski? Still experiencing some issues. And Chair Saragosa? Yes. All right, motion carries. Okay, thank you. And in the history of the shortest uh, chairmanship, uh, I will then move to item three, dissolution of the SACOG uh, Financing Corporation. Uh, and do I have a motion? Move approval. Move approve. All right, I see uh, Supervisor Thomas. Um, do I have a second? Second. second. All right, I got uh, <laughs> Director Middleton uh, on that one. Uh, so we will go ahead uh, to roll call, please. All right, please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Bernasconi? Yes. Burris? Yes. Ferrix? Absent. Gog? Yes. Lozano? Aye. Middleton? Yes. Stollard? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Vice Chair Kozlowski? Yes. All right. And Chair Saragosa? Yes. All right, motion carries. All right, so we uh, have dissolved the financing corporation. And again, I, I cherish my two minute chairmanship of, of the corporation. Get right. it on the resume, Michael. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we are going to uh, adjourn uh, as the financing uh, uh, corporation and uh, reconvene as the SACOG Policy and Innovation Committee. Great. Um, I can pick up item five. Yep. Um, we can accept the prior roll call. So um, this is the item to uh, uh, putting back on your Policy and Innovation Committee hats, uh, accept the and assign the funds from the financing corporation. So um, we're recommending that the committee make a recommendation to the full board uh, on how to use the assets that are coming over from the financing corporation. So um, to Mr. Stollard's question from the prior meeting, there's uh, $2.9 million approximately is the current balance of the financing corporation. Um, back in the early 2000s, SACOG transferred $2 million to the financing corporation. So that grew over time and, and from the proceeds of the sale, which was 1.2 million, the rest has been interest accrual um, through the county pool that SACOG is a part of at uh, Sacramento County. So our recommendation after kind of looking at what's what's been the history of this um, for a long time, uh, SACOG kind of had a um, policy on the books that this would be pledged towards post-retirement health benefits. Um, we found when we were looking into the, the lease um, changes that that wasn't necessarily something that SACOG could impose on this separate uh, financing corporation. Um, and so that hold was taken off. But um, what we are recommending uh, instead is that we use it for a similar purpose, which is putting it towards our pension liabilities at CalPERS. Um, that's where we have a greater liability than the post-retirement health. We've actually done a fairly good job of managing our post-retirement health obligations. Um, and so CalPERS pension liabilities, um, as with most public agencies, are growing. Um, and so we have taken some steps to um, reduce our exposure to those benefits, but this would allow us to take these assets and put them into an investment at CalPERS where they would earn a projected rate of return of 5% over 10 years. Um, and then we could uh, then every year make decisions about whether to use those towards paying off unfunded liability or paying the employer share of our normal contributions. Um, so that's the first 2 million of the 2.9 million. The 900,000, we're proposing that we would split and um, add back into SACOG's normal reserves, um, specifically two different reserve um, allocations, one for uh, legal defense, and uh, as you know, that came in um, handy this last year uh, when SACOG had litigation uh, against its environmental impact report on the MTP SES. And then the second is towards our operating um, uh, reserve. So SACOG, as an agency that receives state and federal transportation funds, 
most of our funding is reimbursement based and so cash flow is really important to us as an organization uh, the last time the board formally changed the um, reserve policy in 2011 uh, it was set at a fixed amount for uh, the equivalency of three months of operating cash our costs have increased in the last decade um, and so this is um, part of a multi-year strategy we hope to increase that three-month operating cash reserve to be closer to what our true three-month uh, reserve needs are. So that's um, that's the, the summary of the recommendation here on this item. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, directors, any questions for staff at this time? Okay, seeing none. Uh, do we have any public comments? No public comment. Okay, great. Um, Okay, uh, so we'll bring it back uh, to the board. Um, anyone want to entertain a motion? I'll move to approve. Thank you. For a second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Uh, we'll go ahead with roll call. All right, please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Bernasconi. Yes. Uh, Burris. Yes. Frerichs, absent. Uh, Director Gog. Yes. Lozano. Aye. Uh, Middleton? Yes. Stollard? Yes. Uh, Thomas? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Kozlowski? Yes. And Chair Saragossa? Yes. Motion carries. All right. And uh, Eric and James, thank you for all the work on this. I know, um, you know being able to prepay some of that pension obligation is always going to be advantageous for us. and. I think um, rebuilding that that depleted uh, or lessened amount uh, from the lawsuit was also, I thought, a great idea as well. It's, unfortunately, we have to deal with these issues as they as they come forward. So uh, again, uh, kudos uh, to the work uh, and uh, to reinvesting these dollars. So thank you. Okay, uh, let it move on to uh, item six. Uh, which is to authorize election of the California Employers Pension Pre-Funding Trust. Um, and again, this is Mr. Johnson. Yeah, last, last one for me here uh, in this lineup. So this is simply just setting up the trust that I just explained with CalPERS. Um, the board would still retain the ability to direct exactly how those funds are used. And our proposal is that we would incorporate that in the budgeting process every year going forward. Um, but the, the funds, once they go over to CalPERS, they, they do stay in this trust, but um, they are controlled by, by SACOG exactly how they're utilized at any given time. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Uh, any questions? Okay, seeing none. Uh, do we have any public comments? No public comment. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we'll bring it back to uh, the board for a motion. Move approval of this item. Thank you, Director Thomas. Second, Bernasconi. Thank you, uh, Director Bernasconi. Uh, we have a first and a second. Uh, roll call, please. All right, please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Bernasconi? Yes. Uh, Burris? Yes. Frerichs? Absent. Uh, Gog? Yes. Lozano? Aye. Milton? Yes. Stollard? Yes. Uh, Thomas? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Kozlowski? Yes. And Chair Saragossa? Yes. Uh, motion carries. All right, thank you. Thank you, Eric. All right, moving along, uh, we're going to, uh, move to item seven, which is approving a draft budget and overall work program for fiscal year 2021-2022. And Ms. Sue has this uh, report for us this morning. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you. Good morning. Um, just give me one second to show my screen here. Yep. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen? We can. Okay. Thank you. Let me just start the slideshow here. Sorry. Um, my apologies. Let's. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so um, 
this uh, the item before you this morning is the uh, draft o budget and OWP for fiscal year um, 2122. Um, the Fixed America Surface Transportation Act called for it's the development of the OWP and budget for the federally designated metropolitan planning organizations. SACARC um, OWP described the continuing comprehensive and coordinated metropolitan planning process for the six county Sacramento regions. The OWP dis established transportation, air quality, and planning activities. It also served as the primary reference for SACOG budget and work activities for the fiscal year. Um, the OWP activities is mainly funded through a combination of formula-based federal and state revenue source and supplemented by short-term discretionary and non-discretionary grants and contract funds. Staff submitted a draft budgets and OWP to Caltrans and federal agencies to review on March 1st, 2021, to, uh, mainly is to, to ensure that SACOG planet activities are consistent with the amount and the purpose of funding source supporting the work program. Due to the size of the documents, a full draft is available to view on SACOG website, which a link is also included in the staff item. Um, so the board will review and release the draft of the OWP and budget at the April board meetings. So um, as noted, the OWP projects and activities in the current fiscal year or fiscal year 21-22 support the SACOG three strategic goals. Some of the example of the programs and activities includes the Civic Lab Innovative, Innovative Mobilities, Mega Region Working Group, Race, Equity and Inclusion Initiative. This is something new for the um, work plan year in fiscal year 21-22. Other um, projects that supporting the goals includes the Innovative Mobility Solutions, the SAC Region Parts and Trails Development Plan, and housing program like the WEAP, and also the Green Means Grow project. SACOC managed two separate budgets. First budget is the operation budget, which includes the overall work program projects and activities includes Capital Valley Regional Safe Budgets, also the user managed funds committed to projects that including um, such as the community design project programs, also the capital asset budget and other local activities. The second budget is the board and advocacy budgets, which includes board related activities, partnerships, and federal and state advocacy work. For the fiscal year 21-22, the estimated revenue is approximately 26.7 million, which is um, a reduce of 6.1 million comparing to fiscal year 2020, um, 2021 of 32.8 million. This is due to projects and funding that were ended or nearly completed in fiscal year 2021. These include the regional bike path data collection projects, next gen transit, big data, and the REAP round one funding. Um, here's a kind of percentage comparison or makeup of the type of revenue SACOP receive. Approximately about 36% or 9.7 million is from the federal government. These include formula planning grants, also congestion mitigations and air quality funding and the regional surface transportation programs. Approximately about 27% come from the state, which including the REAP housing pro uh, program and also the SB1 formula and discretionary grants. Approximately about 20% is from local governments, which is TDA. Um, this is for the um, the four county TDA uh, programs. And then service to save is about 11% of the revenue. And then other that is about 6%. This includes about um, a request to use of 526,000 in fund balance and other 
and other reserve fundings that is also included in this 6% there. For, sorry, for more information about the revenue comparison, um, please refer to attachment A, which uh, comparing the revenue by funding source and also comparing to fiscal year 2021. So it showed the changes by the various type of revenue um, for the two fiscal year. Attachment C is the over, OWP revenue by funding source. And then attachment D is the allocation of revenue by projects and activities. For the fiscal year 2021, the estimated expenditure is approximately 22.3 million comparing to fiscal year 2021 um, with a decrease of approximately 4 million. I um, also want to make a note that the, um, the presentation that previously sent out had an incorrect amount of um, indirect salary that was combined to the overhead. So this slide here reflected the corrected um, amount that is total st uh, staff cost. So I just want to make a note of that. Um, so the staff cost is approximately 48% of the total budget for the year. Um, Consulting costs is approximately 14%. Overhead and other direct costs is approximately 14%. Past due costs is make up about 24% of the budget. This is mainly the re um, funding that we receive that will be eventually passed it on to member jurisdictions over the next two fiscal year. And then, um, and then also the managed funds. So that make up the 24% there. This is just um, show a quick comparison of the headcount over the past five years. Um, as noted in the, um, the staff items, we are requesting um, included in the draft budget is two new positions that is to support the work that is um, in the, um, the race equity and inclusion initiative program. And then also to support the update of the metropolitan transportation plan and sustainable community strategies that is gonna be happening over the next four years. As you can see, um, you know, our headcount had been pretty um, dropped a few over the past couple of years due to retirement, but in order to continue the effort in these two big area, um, we feel that it's necessary to um, have those two new positions included in the current budgets. And then obviously that was one of the reasons that we are requesting use of um, fund balance to cover the, um, the hiring of these new two staff there. Also, I just wanna give you a quick preview of the fund balance. Um, as Eric noted in the item number five, um, with the transfer of the um, funding from the financing corp um, back into SACOC of the um, the 2.9 million approximately. So that would go 2 million to the pension plan pre-funding programs. And then, um, you know, approximately about 275,000 that will go into the legal defense um, reserve account. And then the remaining approximately 625 that goes into the operating cash. So as of June 30th, the balance of the unassigned is approximately about 4.5 million and which make up of these different various categories, which include the TDA carrier over capital asset and then operating cash. And then we also have approximately about 2.9, I'm sorry, 2.2 million of unassigned uh, fund balance. So with the recommendation that um, in item five, that will bring the legal defense up to 500,000, um, that is as of June 30th, 2021, um, projected balance. And then obviously 2 million in the pension plans reserve fund. And then um, that will also um, increase the um, operating cash reserve to about 2.1 million. Um, and then with the use of the 526,000 that is in the draft budgets that will reduce the unassigned down to 1.7 million. Um, so this is, would be the balance, projected balance as of you know, February, I'm sorry, June 30th, 2021 here. And then this is the balance as of June 30th, 2022. 
um, so which is going to be slightly reduced based on these adjustment there. Um, in May, staff will bring forward a, um, a recommendations to revise SICOG um, reserve policy, which has not been updated since 2011. So uh, we will have more details that will be coming um, in May with, with, um, with regards to the various type of reserve fundings and the policy associated with that there. And then uh, lastly, this is the board and advocacy budgets. Um, the budget is approximately about 911,000 in fiscal year 2122, uh, which is an increase of uh, approximately 122,000 compared to fiscal year 2021. Um, included um, in this budget is the use of approximately about 150,000 in reserve board and advocacy fund ba balance. And then this does not uh, this does not include the um, a separate item which is recommending the increase in the board fees. If the board approved that um, recommendations, the final budget for the board and advocacy will be reflected um, to be updated to reflect those revenue, which is not reflected in here. Um, off of the um, the board and advocacy budget, approximately about. 56% um, is staff cost, which is mainly related to the advocacy and technical work, um, support that the staff is providing to member jurisdictions. Board related expenses is about 10%. Advocacy is about 23%. And then partnership is approximately 11% of the budget step. The next step of the budgets. So the board will, um, review and release um, the draft budget and OWP for comment at the April board meeting. And then the board will adopt the final budget and OWP at the May board meeting. Upon adoption, staff will be submitting the budget and OWP to Caltrans and federal agencies. And then these expenditures will be um, start incurring effective July 1st, 2021. With that, I'm going to pause and see if there's any questions related to the draft budget that I can answer. Thank you, Loretta. Do we have any questions? Seeing none. Uh, do we have any public comments on the proposed budget? No public comment. Okay, uh, we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, for any further discussion. Again, Loretta, thank you for walking us through the budget there. I, I do have a question. Um, do we anticipate, and this is, I guess, for Loretta or for the group, um, do we anticipate any direct dollars, any direct stimulus dollars coming into SACOG or how those dollars that go into the, our different municipalities might affect workload uh, at at SACOG level um, in terms of potentially more, more work being asked of, of SACOG from our di different jurisdiction as those stimulus dollars come through. Um, Eric, do I you can want take to... that. If, okay. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so, so specifically the funding that uh, Congress approved in December, uh, there's a bunch of different names, but I think the timing is simpler to divide them apart. The, the, the funding from December um, there is both funding um, for highways and transit in that one that's um, unique. The early stimulus, the CARES Act dollars, um, there was transit only in those funds. Um, SACOG did not uh, take any administrative costs from that. We did do considerable amount of work to help with the allocation of those dollars to our transit agencies, um, but we absorbed that uh, into our ongoing operating costs. Um, Similarly, for the December transit dollars, there, there's nothing coming to SACOG for that. They're coming through SACOG. Um, on the highway side, we are um, proposing to take an administrative take of that because that's typically how we fund a lot of our um, transit or, excuse me, transportation technical assistance and delivery um, efforts is through a percentage of the highway funds that come through SACOG. Um, so there, there is a recommendation for that from the December dollars. Um, in terms of the funding that was just approved to go to cities and counties, um, there isn't a specific allocation for SACOG in that either. Um, so, and then in terms of uh, future, I think maybe we can 
hold that for the advocacy item. Um, but that's a kind of a short summary of where we're at. Thank you, Eric. It, sure, sir. Goes if I if I could though, just on that final point, and as Eric mentioned, you're going to hear from Christina Lockie uh, shortly about the advocacy update on the federal side, and I'm sure you've all been reading about the potential massive infrastructure bill. Potential. Uh, I, you know, I will just put a put a pin in this. You know, every every budget is only our most reasonable estimate, right? And if we were to get a uh, an infrastructure bill on the scale of what they are talking about, um, that would be a tremendous amount of time and staff cost. Uh, so, so stay tuned on that. I think Eric was suggesting, or um, at least giving you some sense of the admin take we have we have historically taken and we did on the December funds. Uh, um, but but it will be a lot for SACOG, but for a lot of your your staff as well. If that kind of a bill comes forward because it would, it would be historic um, and we'd have to act really quickly. Okay. Thank you, James. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Uh, I will entertain a, a motion then. Motion to approve the item. Thank you. I Director second Burke. that. Thank you. We have a first and a second. Uh, any other comments? Seeing none, uh, roll call please. All right, please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Bernasconi? Absent. Uh, Burris? Yes. Barracks? Absent. Gog? Yes. Uh, Lozano? Aye. Middleton? Yes. Stollard? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Thomas? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Kozlowski? Vice Chair Kozlowski, please indicate your vote. Experiencing some technical issues. And Chair Saragosa. Aye. All right, motion carries. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving along on to item eight. Um, these are the member due increase uh, for fiscal year 21-22. And uh, this is Eric. Thank you. So um, in uh, 2019, the board approved uh, an effort to increase membership dues over a three year period. Um, we have uh, done the first two increases uh, of that. And so part of the original motion in 2019 was that we would bring it back every year and just um, confirm with the board um, the, the amount before we did the increase. Um, the amounts are constant from what was set up in the original 2019 motion, but again, the board at that time wanted to just make sure that um, we were recognizing the conditions at every given point. Um, and so the item before you is um, recommendation to consider increasing the third and final of this increase and then move back to um, a, sm a much smaller uh, increase every year thereafter, just based on uh, increases in inflation. Um, and any population changes. Um, the purpose, um, and, and we did give this a lot of careful consideration given the times that we've, we've been in here uh, about whether to move forward with it is um, this is a, a rare source of dollars to help with the advocacy efforts that James was just speaking to. And so we think it's important to, um, uh, if not uh, increase the dues, then you know spend from reserves to really make sure that we are represented as a region at the federal level. And so that's really where the focus would be in this next year is uh, increasing our presence at the federal level. So um, happy to answer any questions and uh, entertain any discussion about this. Thank you, Eric. And I, I'll just put some notes here on the top as well as, you know, when I spoke with James and with Eric, I, I thought it was hugely important as well that we, you know, as much as I, um, you know, I know all municipalities uh, have struggled through this time uh, but I also know that this is a really a potentially a one time opportunity um, at the federal level to ensure that our SACOG region is represented in a way that I know, you know, the Bay Area or Los Angeles is going to be represented uh, when we're going forward and, and looking for funds and, and hopefully, you know, getting some e equitable uh, uh, dollars that come back to our region. So I think, um, you know, as each one of us will, we also receive an infusion of dollars in, in this last uh, stimulus package. 
uh, I, I really felt it was um, necessary to move forward uh, with the increase. Um, you know, if things take a turn again, I'd be the first to say, you know, let's revisit this this idea. But um, I, you know, going forward. But I think for now, I think it's it's very important with the small amount of funds that we have that are actually allow us to do things like this. These are the funds that that will allow us to do it. Uh, the rest of them are pretty much programmatic and, and can't be used to, like, say, for ad advocacy. So, again, I just wanted to, to put those uh, words out there before, um, and then we'll open it up for any other comments or questions. Any any questions on the dues? Okay, seeing none. Any public comments? No public comment. Okay, uh, we'll bring it back to the board for uh motion or comments motion to approve thank you director burris do we have a second? second thank you i heard a second who is uh who did second middleton middleton okay thank you director middleton all right we have a first and a second uh roll call please all right directors please indicate your vote and i call your name uh director bernasconi absent uh, burris Yes. Ferrix, absent. Gog? Yes. Lozano? Aye. Middleton? Yes. Stollard? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Vice Chair Kozlowski? Yes. And Chair Saragossa? Yes. Motion carries. OK, thank you, everybody. All right, uh, moving along uh, into our information items, into item nine, which is our advocacy update. Uh, and Ms. Lockie has this uh, for us this uh, morning. Uh, so the floor is yours, Christina. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna put my PowerPoint presentation here and get started. So as usual, spring is a busy time of year in advocacy. And so I'm gonna start with a federal update. And here we go. As we've been discussing, there's a number of opportunities at the federal level. And I do want to note, we currently have an RFP out for a federal lobbyist. Um, on the federal opportunities, I first want to mention the return of earmarks. The, um, the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee, as well as the Appropriations Committees, have announced that both of their committees are bringing back earmarks um, to their process. This means that there's going to be earmarks for the surface transportation reauthorization proposal, which is the federal funding for surface transportation projects and, and programs. So in addition to regular earmarks, there's also quite a bit of opportunity on the transportation side as well. Speaking of reauthorization, in the Senate, the Environmental um, Environment and Public Works Committee has begun crafting their reauthorization proposal. Now, two years ago in 2019, there was a bipartisan proposal that did pass out of the committee, but we'll likely see many changes as they draft a new proposal now that they have new leadership and there's a new administration. And then moving on to the third um, federal opportunity right now, there's of course the infrastructure proposal. So last week, the president released his American Jobs Plan. According to his um, fact sheet, it will invest about $2 trillion to upgrade our nation's infrastructure, which is very broadly defined. And it makes a number of other investments such as in manufacturing and research and development. There's quite a bit in the outline of the proposal. So these slides are really just to highlight the main spending totals and really focus on the, the pertinent items which are kind of in the first two buckets. Um, the administration is pitching this as addressing four components. They're framing it as how we move, how we live, how we care for others, and how we make and create. So again, I'll just be focusing primarily on the first two. Um, so the first, how we move, that's our big area of interest, obviously includes transportation. And it talks about investing an additional $621 billion in transportation infrastructure and resilience. This includes $115 billion to modernize bridges, highways, roads, and main streets. And to do it with a fix it first focus while also focusing on safety, resilience, and all users' experiences. And the plan stresses improving air quality, limiting greenhouse gas emissions, and reducing congestion. 
there's $20 billion to improve road safety for all users, including increases to existing safety programs and a new Safe Streets for All program to fund state and local Vision Zero plans, as well as other improvements to reduce crashes and fatalities, with again a focus on cyclists and pedestrians. There is also a focus on transit, doubling federal funding with an $85 billion investment to modernize existing transit and help agencies expand their systems. The plan invests $80 billion for um, passenger and freight rail service. It also makes a very significant investment in electric vehicles at $174 billion. The plan focuses on addressing historic transportation inequities, including $20 billion for a new program to reconnect neighborhoods that had previously been cut off, cut off by historic investments and to ensure new projects increase opportunity and advance racial equity and environmental justice, as well as promote affordable access. There is $25 billion for a dedicated fund to support projects that have a tangible benefit to the regional or national economy, but are too large or complex for existing funding programs. And there's $50 billion in dedicated investments to improve infrastructure and service resilience, as well as funding to protect and restore nature-based infrastructure like forests, wetlands, et cetera. Um, so moving on to the second component, there's a big focus on broadband with $100 billion proposed for very investments. It also includes uh, $111 billion for upgrading and modernizing the nation's drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater systems. And this includes funding to remediate and redevelop idle properties and spur the build out of critical physical, social, and civic infrastructure in distressed and disadvantaged communities. And there's money for affordable housing as well. So just real quick on the other three components, there's the third is about focusing on home and community-based care and expanding access. And then there's a big focus on manufacturing, research and development and workforce development. Now, this of course is just a framework with a lot of details and specifics that are gonna have to be worked out in the months ahead. Um, Speaker Pelosi has said that she wants to have a bill put together by the 4th of July. Um, and obviously, um, in some of the, the components I wanted to highlight, I think in addition to our traditional transportation work at SACOG, there's a potential for a lot of opportunity with Green Means Go as well. And so we've already started conversations about how we can be involved um, and help influence the drafting of, of this proposal as it begins to move through the process. So I'll stop here um, just for questions before I move on to state updates. Sounds like you can go move on right. to, the, to the state, yep. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, and I know it's a lot, it, it came out last week, so I think everyone's still trying to digest it a little bit. Um, so moving on to the, to the state, last time I spent some time discussing two SB 375 related bills. Um, again, 375 established the sustainable community strategy component of our long range transportation plan. Um, and in the SES, we must show how we're going to achieve a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Our last meeting, um, there was only one bill with substantive language, SB 261. There was a second bill that had some intent language um, and that was it. Well, since then, that second bill has been amended with substantive language and a new third bill has been amended that does have a focus on changes to 375. So I want to touch on those two new bills to give you an overview since this is um, one of our big priorities in the state legislature um, after Green Means Go. So this is just a quick reminder about the original bill I talked about, 261, it adds new target dates. Um, it includes reduction targets for vehicle miles traveled or VMT. It adds some new reporting requirements and ex uh, significantly expands the California Air Resources or CARB role um, the bill, since we last met, has passed out of the Environmental Quality Committee. Now that was expected because the author is the chair of that committee. And it's now in the Senate Transportation Committee, and I don't believe it's been set for a hearing yet. There continues to be a push to turn it into a two-year bill, and it has quite a bit of support and opposition working on both sides of the, of the bill. Um, so 
Moving on now to SB 475. So this was the bill I mentioned last. Sorry, I got muted for a second. I <laughs> think um, the um, 475 only had intent language before. Um, and so it has been amended now with some more substantive language. I'm gonna go over a few of the, the highlights. It, it makes some pretty major and significant changes. So there's quite a bit in there. Um, I'll try to keep it um, high level. Um, it essentially establishes new GHG targets um, for 2050 and 2030. And it splits that into a focus on long range strategies and near term implementation actions. Um, it establishes a new point based climate impact score. So MPOs must identify near term implementation actions for each strategy and calculate a point based climate impact store score for each action. So those are for the near term implementation actions um, that we will now have to do would now have to do. It does remove CARB review of an adopted SDS, which is very significant. And instead it requires MPOs to submit a progress report to CARB every four years. And in that progress report, CARB must identify implementation actions that they've completed, what obstacles prevented timely completion of the implementation actions and what Christina, new actions are- Christina, yeah. I was just gonna say, I, I noticed Director Thomas had her uh, hand oh, up. Sorry. I just was gonna- See, and I know, I think it was on the last item, she had a question, so oh, I'm sure. gonna just uh, have before we go too far into this one. Yeah, oh. well, thank you, Chair Saragosa. It's all kind of part of this. I guess my general, I don't expect an answer right now, but I just wanna ask, um, let's see, my, my notes here. Um, how is SACOG monitoring um, how the sustainable communities legislation will impact our, you know, local rural jurisdictions, because uh, I know they they don't translate nearly as well as to some of our urban neighbors. Yeah, that's a great question, and um, I, I would say generally, just in general, for everything that we're looking at, when it's whether it's federal or state, we recognize that at SACOG, um, it's actually one of our talking points in the legislature. We, we represent a significant rural population in addition to suburban and um, some, ur some urban areas as well. And so when we are reviewing anything really at the advocacy and an advocacy component, we're looking at how it impacts all of those, those areas. Um, and we do actually talk quite a bit about how one size fits all doesn't help the state and it doesn't even help in our region, right? Because even in our region, we're a little bit of a microcosm of the state in the sense that we've got a wide variety of communities, um, you know, our jurisdictions really range in needs um, and how something is going to be implemented is gonna be very different, um, even just within SACOG and what our communities look like. Really appreciate you raising our voice in all those uh, communications, thank you. Sure, thanks. Thank you, Christina. Great. Um, so, I, so I think I was talking a little bit, and I apologize for, I know this is a lot, so I'll just interrupt me if you have any, any questions. Um, so I was talking a little bit about how instead of having to formally submit an SDS to CARB, instead the M, um, CARB will just review a progress report that the MPO will have to put together. Now what they will be allowed to do is look at the history of our implementation action. And if they decide that an SCS um, is not making enough um, demonstrated and sustained implementation activity from prior um, sustainable community strategies, then they can determine that our SCS is non-compliant. An MPO can appeal that annually. So I think in a way it, it preserves some CARB overview and authority, but it also uh, makes it a, a little less formal and a direct action by CARB every four years. Now the, the proposal does remove the option for an alternative planning strategy. Um, that is a document that can be done instead of a sustainable community strategy if there isn't a feasible way to achieve, achieve the target. And it also would open back up the guidelines process um, the SDS guidelines were established when 375 was first um, uh, implemented and that was it. This will have CAR go back in and do an update to the guidelines. And it also directs them to update the guidelines every four years. Um, 
Two more items that I want to touch on. It creates a new collaborative, is what they're calling it, which would do a number of things, including developing a quantitative tool for MPOs to use to evaluate a plan's consistency with the long range targets, um, as well as make guideline recommendations and identify best practices for implementation actions. And then, I, and then also generate those point-based climate impact scores for specific implementation actions that um, MPOs would now have to generate. The last item, um, it requires the California Energy Commission or CEC to set regional building decarbonization targets for 2030 and 2045. And it allows an MPO to include an addendum to their SCS related to building decarbonization efforts. So in the intent language, it looked like there was perhaps gonna be more of a requirement within the SES. Um, while this does set targets, it does not appear that those would have to be met within the SES, but it allows an MPO to um, discuss that in the SES if they choose. Um, in terms of process, this bill was referred to Senate Environmental Quality and Transportation Committees, just like the Allen bill. It has yet to be set for hearing at all. Um, we're hearing that it's likely to be a two-year bill, um, but that obviously might change depending on if SB 261, the other bill, um, keeps moving through the process. So I will pause here um, before going on to the third bill. Christina, is, the, is there a sponsor on, on uh, 475? So no official sponsor, although um, MTC, our equivalent in the Bay Area, has been very involved in working behind the scenes and helping the author with the proposal. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? Okay. Okay, so I will move on now to the final bill. This is AB 1147 by Assembly Member Friedman. This does a number of things, including a number of SB 375 related changes, which I will focus on. So first it makes changes to the so-called SB 150 report. This is a required report for CARB to put out that looks at the progress on 375, SB 375 implementation. Um, and this report is updated every four years. The bill would also require MPOs to submit by July 1st of 2023, a target action plan for CARB's review and approval. And the plan is supposed to identify elements in the SCS that need changes to achieve, um, achieve the target that's been set for them. That action plan has a focus on equity um, and it must include identification of significant local land use decisions and transportation projects that interfere with a region's target and a designated high priority investment areas that will result in infill, transit oriented development or walkable development or significantly contribute to achievement of the target. So kind of what's hurting the target and then what could help the target. It must also include corrective actions to get the MPO on track to meet its target if needed, including near-term actions as well as a priority list of transformational projects that need additional federal or state funding um, and not to skip you ahead, but that's key for the last bullet that I'll touch on. It also makes changes related to the local regional relationship, including adding language that cities and counties must make a good faith effort to take actions that support an SCS. It adds new data submission requirements, particularly around that SB 150 progress report I mentioned. And it explicitly requires public participation, um, the public participation plan component of the plan to include outreach efforts to disadvantaged communities. And then finally, and I think most interesting for us, it creates the Sustainable Community Strategy Block Grant Program to provide funding, um, state funding to MPOs with an approved target action plan. So that new component that I talked about in the beginning to help implementation of a region's plan. The funding would be administered through the Strategic Growth Council and it would prioritize funding for MPOs to assist in identifying and developing projects that will provide significant and transformative emissions reductions benefits that are not yet ready to begin construction. So sounds a little familiar, I think, maybe for some folks. Um, the author has also submitted a budget request for $250 million to fund that block grant in this year's state budget. 
Um, so this bill is up today in transportation committee. Um, it's up this afternoon and the chair of the committee is the author. So just like 261, it should get out, um, which we expect. And then it's been dubbed what we call double referred. So referred to two committees. If it gets out of transportation committee, it will then go to natural resources committee. Um, and I'll note that the chair previously um, as of last year was chair of natural resources committee and um, the committee consultant for that committee is actually the, one of the main staffers working on this bill. So probably a friendlier committee um, for, for this bill as well. Um, so I'll stop there before I talk a little bit uh, about Green Means Go and kind of how, how that um, works with 1147. See if there's any questions on 1147. Uh, yes, Director Thomas. Quick question. Do I assume these would be unfunded mandates? So these would be changes to the 375, the existing process. So 375, one of our, again, one of our talking points, you've got all our talking points. The state has never um, really come up with a dedicated funding source to help the 375 implementation. Um, so this makes changes to that process. Um, however, it does include that block grant. Now that block grant is not going to um, be very large. If, you're, if it's 250 million this year, it's not gonna be that much for our region compared to um, our needs, obviously. And you have to get there first with these additional requirements. So, okay, thank you very much. Yep. I'm assuming Director Thomas's question was rhetorical also. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. yeah, I, I would still venture to guess this bill will have a hard time in appropriations, but you know, we'll see. Because I, I, I would assume the bill will get out of the next two committees. Yes, yeah, I would definitely assume that. Moving okay. on then. Okay, moving on. Um, just a quick update on Green Means Go. Um, we have been working um, dual tracks. We've got AB 1209 by Assemblymember McCarty, which sets up the framework for potential state funding. And then we've got our budget ask. Um, and then obviously for 1147 throws in another component by I think doing something somewhat similar to what we're trying to do, but obviously at a much, uh, well, a larger scale geography wise, but a much smaller scale in terms of how much funding our region would get. Um, but we're still continuing to move forward with both tracks. We've got quite a bit of movement um, and activation from our delegation on the state budget side. Um, I believe we mentioned previously that Dr. Pan led development of a delegation letter to the head of the Department of Finance advocating for state money, um, state funding in this year's budget. Um, about a week, two, a week and a half ago, he, Senator Nielsen and Assemblymember McCarty had a very positive meeting with her and her key staff about our request. Um, and then we've gotten quite a bit of um, interest and engagement from particularly those members in particular wanting to really prioritize and focus and hopefully push this through in the state budget this year. On the 1209 side, um, like I said, this is a policy component of the bill or of the proposal. It's a policy bill um, in which we just set up the framework should we get the funding. The bill was, um, as I mentioned um, previously, the term double referred, which just means it's been referred to two committees. It was um, referred to transportation committee. And then if it gets out of transportation committee, it will go to housing committee. Um, we've met with the majority of transportation and housing committee members and staff and have had very fruitful conversations, um, but the bill has not been set yet for a hearing date. And that is my, my update. Thank you, Christina. Is there any questions or comments on uh, Green Means Go? All right, seeing none. Uh, again, Christina, thank you for all the hard work and uh, we'll look forward to the next update uh, on that. Okay, uh, then we will uh, move right along here and move to item 10, uh, which is the Mega Region Working Group. Uh, and Clint has uh, this uh, report for us this morning. Thank you, Clint. Good morning. Um, so I've just got a couple brief updates and then I will um, see if either James or Director Kozlowski um, has any interest in, in sharing what they, what they heard as well at the Mega Region Working Group. So 
um, this was uh, not this past Friday, the Friday before, um, March 26th was the first mega region working group meeting um, for 2021 with SACOG, uh, MTC in the Bay Area and the San Joaquin Council of Governments. Uh, this four, first meeting, there were four um, primary pieces of business for the working group to, to take on to kick off 2021. So first was they elected their chair and vice chair. So SACOG was the lead agency for this in 2020 and uh, Director Frerick served as a chair for the working group. This year, uh, Sam Joaquin Cog is the lead agency. So the chair is supervisor Robert Rickman of San Joaquin County. Um, he'll serve as the chair for this year. And then the vice chair is coming from MTC. Um, and that is Supervisor Alfredo Pedroza from Napa County. He'll take over his chair in 2022 when MTC takes up the mantle for lead agency. Um, that was the, the first item. And then we had two uh, really excellent presentations from um, Dr. Jeff Michaels of UOP and then Jeff Belisario of the Bay Area Council. Um, and they both talked about the economic interdependence of the mega region. So they talked about our shared economy, about the travel patterns back and forth between our, our regions. Um, and then they, they focused quite a bit on impacts that we've seen um, during the pandemic and how those impacts are different in the Bay Area from the more inland areas. The Bay Area, San Francisco in particular, has seen a lot higher total job loss than we have in more inland um, communities, uh, largely driven by they've, they're, they're a world city with in San Francisco in particular with a lot of hospitality business. They've taken a huge hit. Um, the construction industry in the Bay Area took a hit, but you actually saw um, relatively stable and in some cases increasing construction on the residential side in the more inland communities, including the Sacramento region. So really interesting presentation, some really great um, statistics and summary statistics they provided. In the handout that you received from Robert on Thursday, um, we didn't have time to mail this out in the original packet, so you would have received a supplemental handout. There's a link to the YouTube video of that meeting. Um, it'll, it should take you directly to those presentations. Um, they're really great presentations if you have any interest in, in taking a look at them. The third item that, uh, that the working group took up um, was what we're really gonna focus on in 2021. And that is identifying transportation infrastructure investments um, to move forward through joint applications to the state, either through SB1 at the next round in 2022, or you heard from Christina about federal authorization and there could be funding opportunities there. Um, one of the goals of our mega region working group is because we have such a shared economy and we have so much travel back and forth that we can really uh, identify some projects, some big projects that have mutual benefits to at least two of the partners. These don't have to be just capacity on the highway system. We're looking at rail. So the two in the framework that they, that they gave um, direction to staff on on Friday, um, there were two primary focus areas. Those were interregional passenger rail projects and freight corridors. Those were the two main infrastructure project focus areas. We also want to work together on the more policy side on um, identifying how we can influence state or federal funding programs to better reflect the policies and the strategies in our long range transportation plans and our sustainable community strategies. So system pricing is one of those policy areas that we have in common across the mega region that we'd want to look for ways in st state and or federal programs to make exploring those opportunities a little bit more streamlined, a little easier. Um, the, the final item that they talked about, um, in addition to kind of giving us that direction on how to go about identifying some mega regional projects, uh, was where to look for those projects. So we're really talking about a major kind of a, a triangle corridor or set of corridors that is um, I-80 that um, extends from, from downtown Sacramento that extends down to the Bay Area. Um, and then um, 580-205 across from 
the Bay Area into the San Joaquin, and then coming back up I-5 into the Sacramento region. Now, this is just a general corridor that we would, um, or set of corridors that we'd be using to help identify projects. It's not a strict boundary. So one of the comments we had from Caltrans District 3, who was on the line, um, was uh, to explore the impacts to Highway 50, a Bay Area traffic and Sacramento traffic. Um, the Roseville third track is another passenger rail um, investment that would extend out of there. So it's really more about kind of focusing any on projects that might serve to benefit travel through that corridor or happens within that corridor. So those were the major highlights of the, the working group meeting. Um, while they did take actions on, on those two recommendations for frameworks, those actions aren't aren't binding as, as described in our MOU. Those are providing guidance to staff any kind of projects or discrete list of projects or joint applications that would come out of this working group would come through the Policy and Innovation Committee and through the SACOG board for, for an action for final endorsement before we would go down uh, the path of, of submitting anything. Um, so we've got uh, three meetings total scheduled for 2021. That first was March 26th. Our next one's in June. And then we have one in September. We're hoping by the time we're finished with that, we'll have a discrete set of projects um, and concepts that we would consider putting forward in, for future funding um, uh, as, a, as a partnership. So that's my brief update. But if uh, James or Director Kozlowski, if either of you have um, insights that you'd want to add, I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over. I will just add. I'll just add one thing, Clint. I think you synopsized the discussion beautifully. Um, the uh, the discussion of uh, trying to understand how that triangular set of freeways would act as a as a quote unquote porous boundary was hilariously convoluted. <laughs> but uh, it makes sense in the end that it's just uh, you know if we've we've got a we've got a mega region that's really made of three. Um, job and population centers, and those are the those are the key connecting threads between them. So focusing on them is is the essential part of what what the work is. So, James, you want anything to add? Yeah, just uh, um, invite Chair Kozlowski and everybody else. I and I and I think having been part of the pre discussion on those boundaries and the corridors, I think what what the if you think about Bay Area, San Joaquin County and us, what they're trying to do is really put the put the geographic emphasis on the cross border, right movement of goods and people between the two regions. And um, as, as you said, we got we got a little bit sort of wrapped around the axle in some way on the geography as, as, as we are always want to do, right? Um, uh, but I, but I and, and remember too, that if you're in the Bay Area and you're, you're the nine county MTC, your Southern border down to um, Monterey and Santa Cruz is actually increasingly uh, very similar. And so I think that, that was part of what was, I think, going on. And I, I, just, I just finally wanna I want to connect Christina's presentation on advocacy to this effort, because while we're talking, and we should, we're excited this year to, to really kind of, as Clint said, hone down on a package of transportation investments that help the mega region kind of better connect. We're also, uh, it's a huge year coming up next year in 2022, once again, for state competitive transportation grants. Um, we potentially have an infrastructure bill in Congress. We, as Christina told you, we potentially have a transportation reauthorization bill. We have a new administration that's really focused on passenger rail. Um, so all of these things, I hope, right, are going to set us up to be more successful at the state level and the federal level when we really have to compete. And uh, we are probably better off uh, uh, having the Bay Area and the Northern San Joaquin Valley right at our side. That's that's what I would just offer up. Thank you, James. Okay, uh, any public comments? No public comment. Okay, uh, any other comments by directors? All right, seeing none, uh, Clint, thank you very much. And we will go ahead and move on to uh, item 11, uh, which is our 2021 SACOG uh, funding round and staff recommendation. And Garrett has this report for us this morning. 
Well, yeah, thank you, Chair. Good morning and good morning, morning. members of the committee. This information item for you is the staff recommendation in the 2021 funding round. Your colleagues on the Transportation Committee last week did recommend this item, so you and your colleagues on the full board will be acting on this item next week. Just some background on the SACUG round. It's a really important uh, source of transportation funding, but within the four county region. So it funds transportation projects within Sacramento, uh, Sutter, Yolo, and Yuba counties. Projects in Placer and El Dorado have separate funding programs. And this staff recommendation before you and for action in front of the full board really is the culmination of two years worth of work. You may recall in 2020 staff, SACOG staff engaged very heavily in stakeholder outreach activities for input on the funding round. And then this committee, your other peer committees, and then the full board spent multiple months deliberating on the funding round and ultimately in the fall acted on what is called the funding round framework. It set forward the goals and the objectives of the, this funding round. And really what you were doing in that deliberation is thinking through how can you work uh, to increase certainty and predictability within a competitive program? And so that framework you adopted made notable changes to this funding round. There are two new program categories, the maintenance and modernization and transformative category. And again, for, the, for that theme of, of certainty, uh, the, the ability for larger awards, for awards that span multiple cycles potentially. And then importantly, the, you formalized what we call the pre-application consultation where SACOG sat down and met with project sponsors before applications were due. And you asked project sponsors, i.e. those that are applying to SACOG's round to prioritize their own applications. So that was within the theme of investment priorities. We also continued our work in application and program streamlining. So we consolidated um, or simplified some, some programs. Uh, we continued to, to streamline the data we use and then broaden those uh, sort of evaluation criteria. Finally, that action that you took in the framework set four primary programs for the 2020 round. This staff item pertains to the two largest, the regional and the community design program. We're taking those together. I wanna to thank my colleague, Greg Chu, who was the lead of the community design program. The first part of the staff recommendation that the transportation community recommended uh, pertains to the budget. So there was this one-time stimulus dollars that the chair talked about in an earlier item. Uh, the staff recommendation, some of them directed were uh, related to transit. Some of them came, as Eric mentioned, from federal highways. Those that came from federal highways, uh, uh, we're, we're recommending to bring into the funding round budget. What that means is originally the budget you acted on had about $182 million of available funding. By bringing in this one-time stimulus funding, it would increase the budget to $198 million. So that's the first part of the action. The second part of the action that you'll consider next week is then the staff recommendation for that award in $198 million. We received over 110 applications to these two programs, collectively requesting more than 465 million, so far above the ability that we have to fund. Uh, to, to, to evaluate those applications, we convened five separate working groups, over 40 people involved, uh, looking at different aspects of the applications. For example, one group really laser focused on the performance outcomes, the second group really focused on the deliverability, budget and scope of those projects. The, the framework that you adopted had those criteria. All the working groups le looked at both quantitative and qualitative indicators, so it was a very holistic review. Those became the inputs into our staff recommendation. And your attachment C, it's a lengthy attachment, but it does, it does describe the, the um, summary of that, that working group review. And we wanna thank everyone that was involved in those working group just like it took a lot of time for the applicants or the sponsors to put forward their applications, we thank those volunteer working groups for their professionalism and commitment. And so finally, then if the board were to, were to adopt the staff recommendation, it will allow the executive director to negotiate and execute any memorandum of understanding and then our project delivery peers to actually work to get these projects into the delivery program. So we tried to keep this staff presentation brief. In short, really the, this recommendation builds off of two, two years of great work a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, robust uh, input and stakeholder feedback. Um, this is the first time, as I mentioned, this, this framework made notable changes. So just sort of a, some sort of top level outcomes for your consideration of this new framework. Within the maintenance and modernization category, one of the largest categories, 19 of the 20 top priority projects put forward by sponsors are recommended for funding in the staff recommendation. Within the transformative category, the other large category, very competitive, but still the staff recommendation is for 10 of the, top, of the top 13 priority projects to be part of the recommendation. So many, many more attachments that get into the details of staff recommendation, but we want to keep our presentation brief. 
my colleague Matt uh, Carpenter and I are both available for any questions you have. And then we also look forward to the deliberation next week at the full board. So chair, back to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and Greg uh, as well on, on the presentation. Uh, any questions for staff? All right, seeing none. Uh, do we have any public comments? No public comment. All right, thank you, Robert. Okay. Um, uh, yes, uh, Vice Chair Koslowski. Yeah, at, at the risk of getting in the weeds a little bit, could you just run through what those priority projects that didn't get funded are? Just because we're bound, one of us is bound to hear about them. Sure, of course. So I mentioned, first of all, in the main sim modernization category, 19 of the 20. So, so the one that did not be recommended for funding is a Caltrans project, an integrated corridor management project in US 50. There, there are recommendations for Caltrans District 3 within the transformative category, but within the main sim modernization, that did not have a staff recommendation for that uh, US 50 ICM or integrated corridor management. Yeah. Within the transformative side, uh, one project was from Sutter County, the Riego Road project. It was the number one priority, priority project. It's not part of staff recommendation. The second is the connector project, the D2A project uh, within the transformative category. There is a recommendation for a connector project in the maintenance modernization on the Scott Road realignment. And then third, the paratransit project uh, travel training program was not part of the staff recommendation. So those are the four, one within maintenance modernization and three within transformative. Gotcha. And what's the, what's the dollars associated with the paratransit project that got left behind? $750,000 was the request within transformative. It, uh, if you attachment C gives a summary of some of the working group comments and, and part of it is uh, uh, the working group also thought there was a, the upcoming innovative mobility TDM program could be a, a good fit for that project. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you. I just figured we ought to surface those a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, uh, seeing no further comments or questions. Uh, again, Garrett, thank you. And we'll move on to item uh, 12, uh, which is our 2021 Regional Active Transportation Program funding recommendations. And Victoria has uh, this item for us this morning. Thank you, Victoria. Good morning, and thank you for having me here at today's committee. My name is Victoria Cacciatore and I'm the program manager for the Regional Active Transportation Program, which is a six county funding program, which uh, SACOG implements as a MPO alongside El Dorado County Transportation Commission and Placer County Transportation Planning Agency. So this is one of the few six county funding competitive programs that we implement. I, this is similar to the last item from Garrett Ballard Rosa, where the Transportation Committee uh, recommended the item to the full board. So this is something that you'll be looked to act upon at the April 15th board meeting uh, to approve this funding recommendation. Well, we have, a, there was a revised item uh, for attachment A that was shared with you last week that noted a change in what was recommended for the regional ATP recommendation. Most notably, it involved uh, the Yolo County project stepping back and the next project on the contingency list stepping forward to be recommended for the $414,000 of partial funding recommendation. So that is what you'll see in attachment A to uh, recap how we developed this process or this program and the funding recommendation. Last May, so May 2020, uh, SACOG submitted a policy framework that identified all the ways that our MPO funding program would be different from the statewide active transportation funding program. It, and those changes included adding a scoring criterion for how projects support economic prosperity or sustainability strategies. It also included a criterion for how projects uh, help achieve regional greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategies. And it uh, 
implemented a 7% non-ATP funding requirement. That is to help us uh, stretch our limited funds a little bit further. And it also identified a 35% target investment of uh, this funding program that must uh, go to benefit disadvantaged communities. And so where we came out with those is that uh, we had a lot of high scoring projects. We had over four times the amount of funding requested as what we actually had to distribute. As, and the recommendation has six projects recommended for all of the funding that they requested from SACOG and one project getting a partial funding recommendation, which they are working with their partners to uh, identify how they will develop a complete funding recommendation or, or a complete project phase since we're not allowed to recommend partial uh, phases to the California Transportation Commission. So after the SACOG board acts on this item on April 15th, if all is approved as it currently stands, we would then as the MPO, send it to the California Transportation Commission to adopt this funding recommendation. And I'll take any questions about uh, any of the uh, any of the process or the funding recommendation or whatever you would like. Thank you, Victoria. Any questions? I have a Victoria question and just timing wise, once um, assuming the board, uh, the full board makes the recommendation to adopt the recommendations, what's the timing on those as they move forward over to the CTC? SACOG is uh, required to submit a draft programming recommendation by April 15th and then a final funding recommendation by later in May. Uh, if we're able to, we will submit everything as soon as possible. Uh, they have uh, the April 15th draft, draft recommendation for programming as close to final as possible. And we may be able to get on the May CTC agenda, which would then allow um, projects recommended for funding through our regional round, be able to request funding technically as or you know by the June CTC meeting. So project sponsors that are recommended for funding could request money as early as uh, I think it's June 28th or something that is when the meeting date would be. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Curious, sir, I guess if- Yes. Other, uh... Just, just again, uh, hopefully do a little bit of uh, connect the dots and give you all a preview. Uh, one of the questions, uh, well, number one, I just want to say uh, uh, from, from, from my perspective, a huge thank you to the staff on both this item, the ATP and the tremendous amount of work that's gone into it. And I think as many of you know, the funding round, the item before, um, a remarkable amount of work. One of the questions we have been asking in the last 12 months in particular through the Race Equity Inclusion Working Group is how do these, these investments, these transportation projects benefit disadvantaged communities, low-income communities, communities of color? And you heard Victoria's kind of um, stat just now. Uh, we have a sort of a geographic lens that we can put on these projects, which really is a kind of a, you draw a boundary. <laughs> it's a, it's not, terrible, but it's maybe not the best, um, uh, most genuine way to, to sort of ask the equity question. But I, I want to preview for all of you, we, we want to ask uh, a deeper equity question, a deeper racial equity question, and a deeper disadvantaged community question on what are the projects that really truly have benefits for communities of color and low income communities? How do we engage those communities in actually surfacing those transportation challenges? Um, those projects, getting them to the phase where they're actually ready to come in in the future. And that is going to be a big question for the Race Equity Inclusion Working Group as we go forward this year. So I just wanna, I wanna flag that because I think it's important. And, I, and I've, I've said this to some of you, but just as an example, when I was a transportation planner in the Bay Area, we got very few projects coming out of our low-income communities, communities of color all around the nine county Bay Area. 
And the board asked the question, why, why are we not seeing these projects? And there's many, many reasons, again, many of which we will, we will dig into in the REI working group. But uh, in part, it was a question of capacity. In part, it was a question of uh, resources, uh, of, you know, um, of, of, also of planners like ourselves and agencies like ourselves actually meeting people where they are and asking the right questions to the right people. Um, in our analysis, we had shown that a, uh, there was a large investment going into Oakland, which if you know West Oakland is a predominantly low income community, African American community. And uh, from, from, the, from the first take on that, it looked like, wow, that's you know fantastic. Look at that big investment going into West Oakland. It was actually the rebuild uh, of the 880 expressway after Loma Prieta. It didn't actually do anything for the community. It was right adjacent to it. It built a big sound wall, didn't do much. And I guess what I'm just, I'm just giving you that preview is um, we want to ask this question in a deeper way, in a more meaningful way. Um, I don't believe this is about a zero sum game where, you know, just the more disadvantaged communities get, the, uh, uh, the less everybody else gets. It, it's, it's got to be, I think, a very different frame on this. So I just wanted to flag this as we go forward, as you talk about this at the board next week, but really moving forward. Is, and, and if you look at anything coming out right now of the infrastructure package of Congress, the Biden administration, you know, and, and the state, uh, we're going to have to answer these questions to be competitive um, at the state and federal level as well. So I just wanted to put that, that pin in and give you a preview. And the REI working group will be reporting as they convene. Um, and we're still assembling that, that working group and that membership. And we'll announce that. I believe Chair Gore may announce that uh, next week. Uh, but it'll be reporting to Policy Innovation Committee as we go forward. So I hope that all makes sense. Uh, have... thank, thank you, James. And thank you for connecting the dots there as well uh, in terms of the bigger picture that we all have to, the lens that I think we'll all be, I, a lot of our work will, will be, I think, focused through, because you're right, those questions will be asked of us as, as we move forward on, on projects, both at the state and at the federal level. Okay, any other comments uh, from directors? All right, uh, seeing none, uh, Victoria, thank you very much for the update. Uh, so our next uh, item is a receive and file on uh, the CalPERS compensation uh, contract exclusion. Um, in terms of uh, any other matter, any any items or uh, anything directors would like to, to say before we sign off for staff? All right, we have a quiet group today. All right, I, I didn't, oh, did I hear something there? All right. That was a croak. That was a crook. All right. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, again, thank you, everybody. I know we had a, it was a, a pretty packed agenda today. So I want to thank you. Um, we got, looks like you'll, you'll get about 15 minutes back of your time uh, this morning. So again, thank you everyone for your participation and I'll see you all next week at our board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Michael. Thank you all. Take Bye -bye. care. Thank you. Thank you.